Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I don't think we can wait, though the audience is less, and that's expected with OPL going parallel. Uh, we'll straight off go into the session. We'll start with yeah. Kiran. Kiran will tell us the basics of trap, how to perform a trabeculectomy right. Okay. So trabeculectomy, uh, perform the basics right. If you want to filter like a pro, you have to perform the basics right. So this is, trabeculectomy is an old surgery that goes way back to 1968 when Dr. Cairns described the excision of Schlem's canal along with the trabecular retinic say, and then restoring the integrity of the corneoscleral coat over the area of the excision. It's the gold standard uh, surgery to attain low target pressures. But even in the best hands, as you can see from the primary TVT study, there are serious complications including vision loss and resurgery in about 8% of patients. So these are in some of the best hands. So unless you perform the basics right, you should basically try to minimize the complications in your trap. So the first step is to get a good exposure of the area of dissection. It's best achieved through a corneal traction suture. So corneal traction suture, the important thing is to get adequate depth into the cornea. If you go too deep, you can enter the chamber and deflate the chamber, after which you'll have to probably fill the chamber with the visco and then go ahead with the surgery. Or if you are too superficial in passing the uh, suture through the cornea, when you push, pull the sutures towards the area opposite, you want the area of uh, exposure, it will cheese wire. So this is the important part of uh, corneal traction suture. It's very good, it obtains uh, very good vector forces and exposes a good area. And uh, you will not end up in uh, very rare but possible chance of a superior rectus hematoma if you are using a bridal suture. Now to conjunctival dissection. With conjunctival dissection, unlike the way our vitreoretinal colleagues handle the conjunctiva, we should be very, very gentle in, you know, uh, trabeculectomy cases. Because most of the times the conjunctiva has been mutilated already by so many anti glaucoma medications that the patient has had. Uh, gentle handling is very critical. At the same time, you should adequately dissect the, especially the subtenant space so that, you know, you get good exposure. Now, uh, Generally, I use non-tooth forceps to hold the conjunctiva and, uh, you know, as I dissect the subtenant space and make sure that wide pockets are created on either side. This particular step of dissection is very important, not only in exposing the area of surgical dissection, but also in subsequent conjunctival closure at the end of the surgery. A good conjunctival closure basically begins with a good conjunctival dissection. You can also, as once Dr. Abhi has uh, mentioned, mark the area of dissection with a, with a, you know, with some blue, and uh, that can actually help in subsequent closure as well. So whether you go for a phonics based or a limbal based flap, uh, the outcomes are not considered very different uh, in best hands. But in generally, if you see the number of green lines, which far outnumber the red lines, which are the advantages of phonics based flaps over limbal based flaps. The downside of phonics based flaps is essentially that you are more likely to encounter conjunctival wound leaks, especially in the context of uh, mitomycin use, but otherwise, you generally find that phonics based flaps are faster and more technically easier, especially in deep set eyes. And also the, uh, the placement of re uh, releasable sutures a little more easier. Of course, with and mitomycin use, <coughs> various doses, less than 0.1 generally has very low efficacy and 0.4 and above tends to have higher hypotony related complications. And 0.2 milligram per ml seems to be a good middle ground. And as far as the duration is concerned, you can, uh, less than one minute generally has lower efficacy. Anything mo more than three minutes generally makes no difference as the tissues are already well saturated with mitomycin by that time. Two to three minutes seems to be again a good uh, middle ground. Uh, more things about mitomycin will be discussed by subsequent speakers. So uh, there are two ways you can use uh, mitomycin. Either you can use sponges. If you're using sponges, it's best to use maximum two or maybe three large sponges rather than multiple small sponges. Uh, these sponges can be placed uh, posterior to the area of dissection, making sure that the conjunctival edge does not come into contact with mitomycin. And uh, with small sponges, sometimes you end up in a little difficulty when you try to remove these sponges. You can have these multiple small sponges getting trapped there and end up fishing for it. 
Also, the other option is to use an injectable mitomycin where you inject 20 microgram subconjunctively. Publications from both India as well as from the US have shown that this is safe and effective compared the same as that of uh, mitomycin sponges and possibly gives a more uh, controlled dosage. Now, after applying minimal cautery, you start the dissection of the scleral flap. Again, various methods. If you are making side cuts, as you notice, I have started a little one millimeter posterior to the uh, limbal area. You don't want a very anterior dissection because the aqueous can get filter into those areas and can create uh, blebs which dissect into the cornea subsequently. You can uh, mobilize the globe with simple butts like what I am doing or if you want a more robust stabilization, you might have to use a, a St. Martin's forceps on the sclera. Then through a little bit of uh, uh, tunneling and uh, some <coughs> dissection under direct visualization, you get a good thickness scleral flap, at least 50% thickness. Thin scleral flaps uh, usually are a recipe for hypotony related complications in the post-op. And as you go on dissecting, make sure you dissect uh, a little anterior to the uh, blue-white line into the cornea slightly. And before making the scleral block dissection, I generally in almost all cases uh, perform a very small controlled slow entry paracentesis. Now paracentesis uh, is more important in cases like angle closure glaucomas or in cases where the pressures are very high because a sudden de decompression can uh, result in choroidals, also in cases like Sturge Weber, which are notorious for uh, choroidal bleeds. Uh, in such cases, they are especially important, but even in normal cases, it gives you better control of the anterior chamber. And in post-operative phase also, for some reason, if you require AC reformation, uh, it is easier to have a pre-existing paracentesis rather than uh, constructing a paracentesis on a collapsed flat uh, anterior chamber, which is very difficult. Now. Uh, cutting this clear block, again various methods, traditionally the punch dissection, but here I am using sharp MVR blade or a s sharp side port blade to make two side cuts and an angled one to cut the uh, scleral block. I find this a very reproducible uh, technique to cut the scleral block. You can basically control the dimensions very easily uh, by this uh, method. And subsequently you perform a peripheral iridectomy. By the time you make a scleral block, there will be sl slight prolapse of the iris sometimes into the uh, wound. and with an angled oneus, you create a broad-based uh, peripheral iridectomy. You don't want a very small uh, iridectomy uh, because y the iris can block the ostium in the post-operative phase in very small iridectomies. Subsequently, for scleral flap closure, I generally use two interrupted sutures at either edges of the rectangular flap and then use releasable sutures. I'll not be discussing releasable sutures because that's again a topic for discussion by another speaker subsequently. Uh, these sutures, the interrupted sutures should not be very tight. They should allow for some filtration. You can use slip knots if you want to titrate the filtration a little. And I usually almost always use a releasable suture, one or two even, after these two interrupted sutures to reduce the risks of hypotony in the uh, post-operative phase. Once the scleral flap is completed, you think the surgery is over, but the main part of the surgery is still remaining, which is uh, conjunctival closure. Uh, irrespective of the methods you use for conjunctival closure, the important to get a watertight closure, especially in the context of phonics-based flaps and mitomycin C use. Um, generally, you should be able to approximate the conjunctiva uh, very easily without much traction as long as you've made the dissections properly in the initial phase. And uh, the two uh, edge anchoring sutures, I try to take a bit of the episcular as well to make sure they are well anchored on either edges. And uh, subsequently, you can use a uh, you know matter suture or even simple interrupted sutures in the adjoining areas. Whether you want to use uh, tensero nylon or it's or vicryl is again left up to you, but vicryl tends to have leave a little more inflammatory changes in the, especially in the early post-op phase, but uh, it's absorbable, that is the advantage. So once you do all this, a uh, small prayer and uh, thank you. That is optional. <laughs> Can we discuss at the end? We are really tight on time. And we got back to back ICs. We have to get yeah. to another hall on time also. So we'll start now after performing the basic trabeculectomy to discuss uh, various complications. Failing bleb, again, a very common issue that one might face. So Dr. Thomas George, a consultant from uh, 
Chaitanya Hospital in Trivandrum, a very prolific surgeon and speaker. He will speak to us on failing bluffs. Good afternoon. The biggest issue is failure of a trap. And a bleb is a reservoir in the subcontinental space for aqu uh, aqueous draining out of a fistula created during the filtering surgery. This fistula should give adequate resistance to maintain the intraocular pressure and allow for enough flow to maintain the bleb going as it is healing. Tissues tend to heal up, and if the bleb is not formed during the immediate post-operative period, if a gap is not maintained between the uh, conjunctiva and episclera in the immediate post-op period, it'll just stick back onto the sclera. And the leak would cause a bleb to fail, and if the leak is near the limbus, one can use a large diameter 18 mm contact lens to sort of tamponade that leak. If it is uh, too big for that, resuture. If not resolving in a few days, resuture. If there's a buttonhole in the conjunctive a little away from the limbus, you have to resuture. And if it's a largest area of leak which is near the limbus, we can bring up the conjunctiva and resuture. All this resuturing involves taking the patient back to theater. That's why we try a contact lens to start with. If there's no blub in the immediate post-op period, massage. Massage. It press beyond the scleral flap and bring up the bleb. Call the patient back more frequently to keep the bleb going for the first one or two weeks. You do not want to cut any scleral sutures or cause uh, a reduction of scleral resistance in the first two weeks because if there's a sudden reduction there, you're going in for hypertony and going in for choroidals, which will be dealt with by a subsequent speaker. So conservative massage for two weeks. Increase the topical steroid use if there's any sort of excess congestion, especially and anyway the topical steroids tend to make the healing slower and that's what you want if the blood is not doing too well. Release a suture or do a suture laser with a laser only after two weeks and if that also doesn't work, we can plan on needling the blood and that you should not even think of before three weeks because you need some amount of healing there and some resistance before we make it a bigger blood. The need needling typically is for a failing filter and not for a failed filter. Having said this, I would go on to needle a blood even much later because it's a lesser procedure than re-exploring or doing a fresh new trap even years down the line. But the, typical, the ideal timing would be somewhere between three weeks and three months. That's when the tissues are still healing up and you can release the scar tissue and put an extra dose of antimitotic and hope that it works. The procedure is to create a long subcondylar track, use sweeping movements to dissect the scar underneath. You can even go under the scleral flap if you think the scleral scarring is more than, at the end of it you can give a little bit of uh, 5 fluoroacyl, point, uh, uh, 5, mm, uh, 5 mg of 5 fluoroacyl, that's 0.1 ml of the 50 mg per ml, or mitomycin C at 0.2 mg per ml, 0.1 ml away from the ostium because you don't want it to go undiluted into the AC and cause coronal decompensation because both these solutions are highly acidic and treated like a fresh trap postoperatively. This mouse doesn't work. It is not working. And mouse is not working. Can I have a mouse pad or something? Can you give me access to the folder so that I can play the video stream? Yeah. Needling, the video that says needling. Yeah. 
we are losing time. Can you just open the folder so that I can see it? Last one. Last one. Just play it. There I sort of estimate the distance I need and make sure I puncture it as far away from the area as possible because I don't want to leak through that needle track which would happen if it's too close. And you can see the bleb starting to form as the, the scar tissue is cut and once you got a good decent bleb going, turn the needle away so that you're far away from the ostium and inject slowly so that you do not send a high concentration of this drug into the AC. Can I get back to the PowerPoint? Also move under the lab because it's reflective. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, ring of steel again, it will be dealt with in more details soon. It basically is, if you use mitomycin for over a small area, you would have scarring at the edge of where it is, and you would have a dense scar like that, which we would avoid with a larger exposure, which is what Kiran said, push the sponges posteriorly while you're doing the trap. A ring of steel also can be helped with needling because that ring can be cut with more difficulty, but it can be cut with the tip of the needle as you sweep into the subconjunctal space. If there's no bleb in an older trap, you can consider what's called internal re-exploration. And for that, you need a gonioscopy to make sure where the ostium is and a paracentesis is done, you need to put some OVD in because this would make the, the bleb to, I mean the AC to collapse because there's quite a bit of distortion there. You need to use quite a bit of force with that spatula. You go through the ostium with a blunt instrument like a spatula and push so that you dissect the original wound. As any of these scleral wounds, it will not heal up to original scleral strength. So if you push, it will take the preferred path of the original flap wound. I hope it works here. Yeah. So I go through the ostium which I have already identified with gonioscopy. You can see the spatula come in the subconjunctal space right on top. And once you've got an axis like that, if you don't have enough of a blub there, you can needle through that because you've started a flap there, it can be used to needle. Blub revision would be the a more involved procedure where you would excise that vascular blub. Nowadays I use avastin, uh, I use uh, ologen, and uh, earlier we used to use uh, stored sclera but now with allergen being less available, we may have to go back to that. And I've speeded up this video a little bit. Uh, yeah. There's again a preferred path, which is why I can do quite a bit of the dissection with the sponge itself. And later on, I do a sharp dissection where it's still stuck. Once I've excised the blood, make sure the conjunctiva can reach up to the limbus for a water head closure. With ologen, it's simple. You just put it in there and close the conjunctiva. With the, if you're using sclera, you need to actually suture it down all four sides, not just like a strap flap where you suture the back end and close the conjunctiva watertight on top of this. That should restart the trap. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. So after we have discussed failing blebs 
uh, I invite uh, Professor Dr. Andrew Braganza. So he will, he is the uh, Professor of Ophthalmology at uh, CMC Vellore. In fact, uh, except myself, all the other speakers are former Vellorians. <laughs> so Dr. Andrew. <laughs> no, Andrew. So, uh, uh, so Dr. Andrew Holder, will Holder, talk us talk to us about uh, hypotony, which is one of the uh, most common complications in TRAB. Uh, so he will give us the complete lowdown on hypotony. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I hope uh, that the lunch is not having too much of a somnolent effect. Uh, so the lowdown on hypotony. Um, what do we define it as? Generally, one says pressure less than eight millimeters, maybe less than six millimeters. You can define it any way you want, but really it is situation dependent. So it's a low IOP, which is associated with corneal folds, with macular edema, with uh, wrinkling of the internal limiting membrane, sometimes with disc edema. So if you have something apart from the pressure, you have some other effect going on, then you would say, okay, this is hypotony, or at least this is hypotony that I have to deal with. Any patient post a TRAB has a routine post-op examination, which includes a uh, CEDLS test uh, and all the rest that I've listed there. Very important is gonioscopy because uh, we use a formula gonioscope very gently. It doesn't need a linkage fluid. It sits directly over the cornea and you try and assess what's happening on the internal opening of the TRAB. So, Let's take the clinical approach now. If you have a low IOP with a shallow anterior chamber or with a normal chamber depth, this is really the two options that we have. So here we have a situation of low IOP and one has to look at the bleb configuration. So if you have a flat bleb and a low IOP, you have to assume that there's a leak. And you do a CEDLS test. If the CEDLS test is positive, there's a, an in edge leak or maybe a leak elsewhere. You can try conservative management. As Thomas George said, you can use a large diameter contact lens. Uh, you can maybe even use glue with the lens. You can use a pad and bandage um, and uh, you know try and flatten that uh, leaking edge. If that doesn't work for in about 24 to 48 hours, if it's still spontaneously leaking, anything will leak with a little bit of uh, persuasion, especially if you have a phonic space flap. So if you press on the bleb, it will leak. But spontaneous leak is what we are looking for with the CEDLS test. Then one has to revise and re-suture. And uh, sometimes uh, if you have a CEDLS test negative, but still low IOP and a flat bleb, then you have to assume ciliary shutdown. Now, if we go on to the other side of that, uh, you have a formed bleb with low IOP. That indicates that it's overfiltering. And you can try and stop the overfiltering by encouraging a little bit of scleral flap uh, healing with pressure over the bleb. And you can do that pressure with a so-called torpedo bandage. You roll up a pledget of cotton wool till it's a nice hard little uh, you know, spindle-shaped thing and put that over the eyelid and tie a pad and bandage over it. Uh, you can use Simon shell, which is just designed for that. You can use a large diameter contact lens again, Put a little bit of uh, pressure over the bleb. And you can try interventions like fairly uh, innocuous interventions like uh, autologous blood injection and compression sutures. If these don't work, then you have to go and revise and re-suture or find out why it's over-filtering. And sometimes you may even have to go on to doing a scleral patch graft. Looking at things a different way, early and late hypotony also needs to be thought about a little differently. In early hypotony, you have to revise in your mind what is the other factors which are controlling the flow through the uh, trap. And the main thing is the amount of overlap of the scleral flap over the internal ostium. Also, the tightness and the number of sutures with which you have uh, sutured the scleral flap. The thickness of the scleral flap does matter. And last of all, really the least important is act the actual size of the ostium. Other factors which can cause hypotony would be, as I've listed before, uh, edge leak, ciliary shock, conjunctival buttonholes, which have to be sutured. Choroidal effusions do cause hypotony, chicken or the egg effect. If you have a choroidal effusion already present when you have finished your surgery, then that eye is going to be hypotonic. 
there are rare causes like a foreign body in the under the scleral flap that's a cotton fiber or something like that uh, which is actually acting like a wick to allow more flow uh, and keeping the scleral flap uh, raised so it doesn't heal easily and very rarely you can while doing excising your trap block you can cause a small cyclodialysis and this will usually resolve with atropine and things but you would have hypotony in the early post operative period you would be able to pick it up if you do a careful gonioscopy but it's extremely rare so what do we do in the examination i've already uh, listed these before i won't go over it again gonioscopy is important very very important just to do a dilated pupil indirect ophthalmoscopy because the presence of choroidals is going to change how you're going to think about that eye and what you're going to do in the next 48 to 72 hours. So early conjunctival leaks, okay, all phonics based flaps leak with up to 48 hours uh, postoperatively. If you have a spontaneous edge leak and you can see that the, you know, the edge is loose, you have to re-suture it and I would usually do it under topical anesthesia and uh, that video is illustrative of that. So tighten the sutures, put as many sutures as you need to. You need to reform the chamber with, you first put in air and then you need to reform it with fluid and that fluid has to stay retained. Another option here, when you have no edge leak, but you have an overfiltration, is to use Simmons shell. And this is what the Simmons shell looks like. Um, it's sutured with that platform over the bleb, so you're putting pressure on the bleb and you're actually pressing on the scleral flap and trying to get it to heal uh, a little bit. The uh, Simmons shell can be sutured onto the uh, conjunctiva or uh, when we rarely, use, we rarely use it nowadays, but you can use it just placing it within the eye and then putting a pad and bandage over that. The torpedo bandage I've mentioned before, so you take a pledget of cotton wool and roll it very tight. Um, one little trick that I have discovered clinically when trying to assess whether one of these conservative methods is going to work is when you have a shallow chamber like that, you support the bleb with your thumb through the eyelid. And as you can see, the chamber has formed. It was much, much flatter earlier. And now with your thumb supporting it, it has formed. That means you've got a lot of aqueous being secreted. And the moment you stop the outflow of aqueous, the chamber spontaneously forms. If you have to intervene surgically, what, uh, you know, what's the timing of the surgery? So if you have a shallow anterior chamber, that means definitely choroidal effusions have already formed. Now you can try conservative management which consists of atropine and one of these methods I've mentioned but it usually won't work once you've got established choroidals. If the uh, pupillary collarate is touching the cornea, that means it's very, very close to being an almost flat anterior chamber, you have to intervene. Otherwise, you're going to get a fair amount of corneal damage, particularly in a pseudophagic eye. So what's the intervention? It's a choroidal drainage, and this is uh, the method I use. Um, you reform the chamber with air, you go about three and a half millimeters uh, posteriorly after reflecting, a, a, in, usually in the infratemporal, infratemporal area. I make a radial incision center on that uh, 3.5 millimeters and slowly cut down to the sclera. Use an instrument to depress and press there and you can see the amount of fluid that's flowing out and it will keep on flowing. And once you've adequately drained some fluid, you reform the chamber with balansol. You've already put in air, but the chamber has to stay reformed without any, uh, you know, up thrust from behind. Stay formed with balansol, and that's your end point. I usually uh, use uh, cautery to cauterize the scleral edges so that uh, it delays the healing of this uh, that drainage site, and I wanted to keep draining for the next two or three days. That closes, closes spontaneously. When I've had occasion, rarely, to go and re-explore the site, I find it difficult to find where that incision was made at all. The surgical interventions for uh, early overfiltration would be to first leave an air bubble or viscoelastic in the eye and suture a shell, and if that doesn't work, you have to re-explore. 
Re-explore means re-suturing, placing additional sutures on the sclera, etc., etc., or eventually going for a scleral patch graft. You can patch the sclera with a reflected flap of sclera like this. Um, you late uh, overfiltration is indicated if the chance of infection is high. So if you have a conjunctival fistula which is constantly leaking or breaking down, and if you have hypotony maculopathy or corneal edema which is affecting the vision, you have to intervene. Um, what are the interventions? You can try the fairly conservative stuff like autologous blood injections, compression sutures, or else go on to the re-exploration and patch graft. So this is the technique of autologous blood injection. I'm going fast. It looks ghastly and it doesn't always work. In fact, it works about 50% of the time or less, but it's a very, very innocuous uh, intervention and uh, I don't hesitate to use it. Uh, compression sutures, this illustrates the compression and they work very well. Uh, the scleral patch graft uses donor sclera, which, uh, sorry, a little bit more. Uh, I've just got a series of photographs to show you how the scleral patch graft is done. It's important to suture at the limbus and also to put a conjunctival mattress suture. And finally, a word of warning. Hypotony is a continuing process. It leads on to choroidal effusions. The choroidal effusions uh, can cause uh, rotation of the ciliary body. This can cause aqueous diversion, and therefore hypotony can lead to malignant glaucoma. And uh, here's one such case which started off with zero pressure, was brought to me with an eight pressure, but had uh, malignant glaucoma for which I had to intervene and um, had a good result. So the summary of this is that a careful post-op slit lamp examination, monitor the bleb configuration, uh, leaks and choroidal effusions must be addressed, and you do a bleb revision or patch graft only if the hypotony affects vision. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go on to Dr. Ronnie's talk, uh, how to enhance trabeculectomy using antifibrotic agents. Yeah. So thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I think after they showed my presentation two times, it's not going to come back the third time. <laughs> So I'm essentially going to talk about these two things, creation, use of antimetabolites and use of sutures. So basically we don't want blebs which look like this and that's very important because with the use of antimetabolites, this does happen. So you need to use it properly and safely. And uh, Kiran has already alluded to this that you can actually use mitomycin 0.2 or 0.4. Those are the two commonly used concentrations or 5-FU which you use undiluted at the same concentration. Duration varies from one to three minutes in both of these. Nowadays, the use of 5-FU at the time of the primary surgery has come down substantially and we normally use only the uh, mitomycin. It's important that when you reconstitute mitomycin, that you reconstitute, it comes in a two milligram per kg uh, per uh, ml, uh, a two milligram powered powder. So you reconstitute with five ml of water for injection. It's important not to use BSS because that's not what's supposed to be used. And when you do this, you get about 0.4 milligram per ml. If this is what you want to use, you just use that solution from the bottle the same way. If you need 0.2, you take one ml of this, dilute it with one ml of water for injection and use that. So the dilution is very important. Whenever you have a new theater nurse, you need to know, you need to actually train them. It makes sense to leave this written up, up in your OT so that there's no confusion. And then you put it in a little bowl like that those three sponges that you're using then in this case four sponges that you have there are soaked in mitomycin and this is what you place under the conjunctiva. It's important that you do not take shortcuts on this. You do not decide to use something like uh, cotton uh, the uh, cotton because those little fibers once they are soaked in mitomycin and left they will not come out from under the conjunctiva and they will stay there and cause problems. Whenever you're applying antimetabolites you need to follow the large area treatment protocol that was described by Peng Ho. And this is basically to prevent the ring of steel from appearing. So when you treat a large enough area, just like Thomas was demonstrating, at the edge of the area that you have treated, you have partly treated cells. And that sets up, sets up an inflammatory reaction, resulting in a ring like that, which keeps pushing your bleb smaller. And you land up like with a bleb that looked like what I showed you in the first picture. Hmm? So when you're... Yeah, it's all supposed to play automatically. So anyway, uh, it, uh, 
So whenever you're applying the mitomycin, this has already been demonstrated, but here you just, uh, what I want to show you is I'm going to, we're using three sponges and we're trying to push them as far back and treat as large an area as possible. So this is the supero nasal quadrant, but you can see that the sponges are occupying a, a fairly large area there. And once you have done this, don't forget to take off the sponges and do a sponge count. This is really, really important. You should know how many sponges went in and you should know that the same number come out. And that's absolutely essential whenever you're using an antimetoplate. And once you have got the sponges out, the forceps that you use to handle the sponge and the bowl of mitomycin goes off the trolley immediately so that even by mistake, you do not use these um, instruments on the eye again. Hmm? So if you want to l avoid these localized thin cystic blebs, it's important that you wash the mitomycin. I'm not going to show this video. There's nothing much there. And it's also important to talk. Uh, so we'll now come to the next step, which is suturing the, uh, the incision. So when you're suturing, obviously, you're going to suture the flap. And when you suture the flap, the two questions that come up very commonly is, does the size of the flap matter? The size of the flap doesn't matter from a filtration point of view. Does the shape matter? Shape also doesn't matter from a filtration point of view. What matters is the overlap. That is, what is the distance between the edge of the ostium and the edge of the flap? So if you have very little overlap, you'll need to put a tighter suture there. If you have very uh, huge overlap, you can actually manage with a looser suture. And this is the only thing which really matters. Hmm? You try and direct the flow posteriorly. You try and dissect anterior nuclear cornea. This kiran has already uh, covered. And see, look at the position of the sutures. Now, if your sutures are sort of in the middle of the flap, then you're going to have flow anterior to it, which is going to result in a slightly anterior bleb. If you keep your sutures closer to the base of the flap, your flow is directed posteriorly, and this is what you try and achieve so that you land up with a posterior bleb, which does not cause you issues. The flap closure, you need to titrate the tightness, you need to titrate the flow, and you need to be able to do something with it post-op, which is why it's best to use releasable sutures. You need to mark the critical suture. The critical suture is when you're doing the suturing, where did it flow from the most? Was it the nasal side or the temporal side? Or if you prefer to put a fixed suture nasally, was it the superior side? So you mark that as a critical suture because you know that whenever you're taking that suture off, you're most likely to have more of flow. So if you're taking it off very early post-surgery, you may not want to take off the critical suture. You may want to wait for that. And the other thing you need to make sure is once you have sutured, you have no overfiltration on the table. It's much easier to deal with a high IOP than a low IOP post glaucoma surgery. So whenever you're taking the releasable injury, uh, so there are a few things. One is the limbal entry should be through the cornea and not subconjunctival, because if it's subconjunctival, it act like a wick. You should trim or bury the edge to avoid a windshield wiper syndrome, and you should use multiple releasable in high-risk eyes. So basically what you're doing here is, uh, what I'm going to, you can play this, yeah, okay, this is the, So what I'm showing you over here is the dotted portion is the intracorneal portion of the suture. So you're taking that intracorneally. The only reason to take this intracorneally so it is, doesn't hang around there and irritate the uh, surface of the eye. Now this part is important. When you're crossing the limbus, you should be intrastromal in the cornea. You should not be subconjunctival. Then you come out partial thickness through the flap and you take another partial thickness pipe through the sclera, then onto the bed on the other side, and you take a slip knot. Basically, you can take three throws or four throws. Less than that, you are not going to get a slip knot, but at least three throws. And you cut the loose end. So that's all that there is to it. What I've, uh, can you play the video please? What I've tended to do now is I have extended this uh, buried portion. I come in reverse from the sclera. This is what you're seeing there. And I leave a very, very small corneal loop. And the rest of the suture is similar. So what happens there is you don't have that little edge either. And with this reverse, that get epithelized very, very easily. And you don't even need to bother about taking it off later if it is epithelized. So when you want to titrate the intraocular pressure, basically what you're doing with your sutures post-op, usually it's best if you do it within three weeks of surgery. It may be a little effect more effective with antimetabolites, you may be able to push it a little bit longer, but whenever you release or do any, uh, anything to the suture, do it one suture at a time. Do not massage immediately after release and 
assess your IOP and BLEB and AC depth an hour later. So play this video, please. So basically, this is somebody who's already had uh, a bleb. This is post-op. And you can see that I've got the patient on the slip line. Patient is looking down. And I'm trying to massage. And nothing much is happening. So this is a classic situation in which you would decide to do something to that suture. So here you have two options. You can either remove or releasable, which I'm unfortunately not, neither of these videos is working, which basically means you just need to pull that uh, that suture and take it off. Or you can use an argon laser suture lysis where you use an argon suture to tamponade the suture and just use a laser to cut it. Both are fairly effective. And if done properly, this is pre and post release. You can see that a small little uh, scarred bleb post argon laser suture lysis, you're seeing a fairly large diffuse bleb which goes around. So if you have done it as a correct time, you can probably get a fairly good result. Don't forget that if you're very aggressive with this, you might sometimes end up with a shallow anterior chamber even there. So when you want to maximize your surgical outcomes, the use of antimetabolites and the use of releasables are critical to this because one helps with the healing, the other helps with the titration of flow. And both are critical steps in trabeculectomy surgery as with everything else. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rani. That was nice and well explained. And I wish the last video also worked. Uh, next, we have Dr. A.B. Jacob. He will tell us about intricacies of cataract surgery in a filtering eye, in a post trab eye. Uh, thank you, Thomas George. Uh, Rani said that it is a pleasure to be here. For me, this is weather back home minus one degree centigrade. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, great. So uh, we know that 50% uh, of cataracts, uh, uh, trabeculectomies will tend to uh, produce cataracts in uh, faking patients if you follow them up over a period of five years. The mechanism of cataract formation is not very well understood, but we also know that if you have problems like a flat anterior chamber following cataract surgery, your chance is almost double, more than double, of developing cataracts. Cataract surgery also increases the chances of bleb failure. Uh, various theories are, 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 are uh, promoted, <clears throat> but then nobody really, again, knows the answer to this uh, question. So um, cataract surgery is done following trabeculectomy in uh, a few situations. Uh, the standard one is a routine cataract extraction when, when we do an elective uh, surgery a few years down the line. But then there can be also the desperate cataract surgery in things like aqueous misdirection or a flat anterior chamber where you have to create space within the anterior chamber. But I'm not going to deal with that because that's a totally different ball game. You can also find in certain situations that your lens can get intumescent and uh, sometimes block the, uh, um, uh, the uh, ostium, and then you might need to open up the angle, and therefore that'll be a sort of a phacomorphic sort of situation. The aim, of course, is to improve vision, but then it also improves your visibility into the, um, uh, to look at the disc uh, and assess uh, the, 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 the progress of glaucoma, because ultimately we are dealing with a glaucoma here. You have to minimize the loss of intraocular pressure control by using anti-scarring agents if you need to, and uh, minimize the risk of scarring. Again, people have talked about all these things. Uh, we tend to try and keep it less complicated and try not to do any fancy stuff. If not uh, absolutely required at the time, just try and do a decent cataract operation and get the hell out of there. Following surgery, of course, you have to wash them very carefully and uh, treat it appropriately. Risk of failure is increased in young patients. Patients who already have high IOP, quite often they'll be on meds. Uh, unlike the standard trabeculectomy patient who has been off medications for quite some time. Uh, and then, of course, early, early intraocular pressure spikes is a risk, manipulation within the eye. And then, of course, the dreaded posterior capsular rest, uh, rupture and uh, vitrectomy. So uh, blebs can be associated with any of these operations that are here on this list. Uh, and I'm therefore not uh, uh, deliberately including all the microsurgeries that we do these days. Uh, 
it's also important to make an assessment of the bleb to make sure whether there's a nicely functioning bleb or whether it's a so-so bleb or there's a failing bleb. Then, of course, your strategy changes a little bit. Um, of course, who is doing the operation? See, I, you know, I work in a teaching hospital, so there are fellows who want to operate on these post trabeculectomy eyes, so you need to decide who is doing it. And then, of course, I also operate in three different theaters, so you need to find good theaters, uh, a good, uh, the theater with the best team to do these things. Uh, very important that you start planning early and you need to start looking for all those risk factors that could be lying buried in this patient who has had a trabeculectomy 10 years ago. So finding the pre-op uh, uh, operative notes is very important. Looking for any potential weaknesses on the lens zonules is very important. Uh, planning mitomycin, firefew, all those things. And like I did mention earlier on, opening up angles sometimes once in a while. Again, uh, you want your patient to earn the surgery. This is an operation that could potentially lead to the bleb to fail. So you want this patient to be symptomatic at least. Having said that, you don't waste, uh, wait till it becomes a really difficult operation. Because like I did say, the one thing that you have to do is to get a safe operation without a vitrectomy. Anything else, a glaucoma surgeon will be able to manage, okay? So here is someone who has had a cataract operation uh, uh, some time ago. This was a very uh, avascular sort of bleb. We did give her some mitomycin and we did break the, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a point uh, here, but we did break the, um, the edge where the ring of steel was. And despite that remaining sort of avascular and uh, horrible looking, um, that bleb is still functional and the pressure is quite, quite reasonable. And uh, I thought I had, I think I pressed the wrong button, okay? And that's an OCT of that same bleb. And you can see that there's a ring of steel at the back, but there are areas through which that is uh, leaking adequate aqueous to keep that intraocular pressure under control. This is the fellow eye of the sa same patient. This needs to go for cataract surgery. And you can see this is the sort of cataracts that we do back in the UK. Unlike the ones that uh, you guys were doing trabs on, they would have had their cataracts a long time earlier. Uh, and this is a lovely bleb, and you have to have a strategy to operate on someone like this. Here again, we, I'd probably use the mitomycin in the uh, uh, in the area where there's no bleb, I, but I'll definitely give some intraoperative mitomycin and just make you sh sure that you have a clean surgery. This is again another one uh, that requires surgery. So as you can see here, I use a strategy. I use no mitomycin in someone like this because I want that bleb, uh, that bleb to look a little more uh, uh, vascular if possible. I want that bleb to fail a little bit. That pressure is very low. It's running at around four or five. If it goes up to seven or eight or nine or ten, I don't have a problem. I don't lose any sleep over that. So again, like I did say, you have to be sure of the theater where you're operating on these patients. You need to know the, you need to have planned your strategy, whoever is doing the operation, and you need to be prepared for uh, whatever is coming. Uh, of course, you have to have, see, we have to order out the mitomycin. You can't draw mitomycin uh, in the theater. So the mitomycin has to come from the pharmacy, so it has to be there, otherwise you can't do the operation. You have to protect the bleb, especially if you have dodgy blebs of the, the sort that I showed you, because they can uh, get damaged during the procedure, and you don't want to do that. Other interesting thing is astigmatism management, and it is... Uh, um, um, something that I'm getting interested in these days because you get these funny blebs and you wonder whether you should correct it. I tend not to correct the whole of it. I tend to correct a little bit of it. And patients seem to be happy. It might just be because the pressure did go up a little bit and it, uh, because especially if someone has a lower IOP, uh, any astigmatism tends to get exaggerated. So I just need to be aware of that too. And I've deliberately put FACO versus six versus uh, Eki here because again, uh, there are people here, I'm sure, who operate in different situations. You don't have to be embarrassed to do an Eki or a six uh, because, again, like I did say in the beginning, 
the most important thing is not to do a vitrectomy. Anything else, most glaucoma surgeons will be able to manage. Uh, I have the luxury of using intracameral dexamethasone. So again, I tend to load the anterior chamber fully with uh, dexamethasone these days and a little bit of uh, kefiroxin, that's, that's an antibiotic of choice in the UK, because that helps to sort of uh, uh, kick off the process without you having to give a subconjunctival injection and disturbing the conjunctiva se separately again. Uh, Postoperatively, of course, you have to be very intensive with the, uh, uh, um, the, the steroids. You can use uh, uh, ketorolac or nepofenac as required. Uh, quite often, we tend to do it um, for these patients who do have um, any sort of uh, diabetes or any macular problem, but not on a regular basis. I think I'm almost finished. Yeah, thank you very much. Any questions? We'll take it. Fabulous. If anyone has any questions, we can take it off. Uh, yeah, Madam Mulgaard. Uh, Vicryl also, it, it in the process of getting uh, absorbed, causes inflammation. And absorbable sutures, the inflammation around it would cause a little bit of tissue breakdown. So you can have a leak or a little bit of uh, conjunctiva breaking off where the suture is actually in contact and cause a leak. Having said this, that excessive reaction happens in probably one in hundred patients, but that conjunctiva is difficult to repair. So I personally use only tensile nylon, and he, I think, yeah, uses. I, I, I use the anchoring sutures. I still now use tensile, and this matter suture I just put away. But uh, uh, the other disadvantage with uh, Vicryl is that as it gets absorbed, so you leave a thing, as it gets absorbed, it gets loosened and it becomes more, you know, pointy. And uh, by the round third week and all, it starts creating more uh, post-operative problems. I, I use Teno Vicryl, and uh, yeah, Vic Vicryl. Uh, Vicryl is horrible. The cut end of the Vicryl is worse than okay. cut end of nylon, okay? It is it is like a barb in the eye. So till it softens, it is it is a bit of a pain. And, and I tend not to bury my knots as well. So patients are saying hello. Yeah, they, they, know they, is, they know that they got operated. Uh, so, yeah. Any other questions? Anybody? Anybody? That's it, right? Thank you very much. Uh, that's it.